Okay. Oh, should I start? Okay. Hi. So I want to tell you why you should write a Wayland compositor. That obviously raises a couple of questions, like what's exactly Wayland, you know? What is a compositor? Should I start another side project? Um, so let me first give you a quick introduction into who I am, why I think I'm qualified to talk to you about this stuff. Um, so my name is Victoria. Um, I am be able to find uh, with the username Dracolix on various platforms. And I work for System76. And I build, uh, I'm building their new um, desktop environment for uh, PopOS. So closer to the microphone. It's a little annoying because I can't really exactly, OK, maybe, maybe that works better. OK. Um, yeah, so I'm on the desktop team. So I built the new Wayland compositor that is kind of needed for a new Wayland uh, desktop environment on Linux these days. Um, I'm also a member of the Wayland Protocols repository, which is like the governing repository with people from various um, interests in Wayland, from GNOME, KDE guys, and, and whatnot, Collabora, um, to discuss which parts of the protocol could be, should become standard, might be standard in the future, how they could be changed to better uh, accommodate certain use cases and stuff like that. And I'm also a founder of Smithy, which is a small little compositor library, you know, um, written in Rust. Um, and I've been doing that for about five years, um, which is why I'm now working at 76 for uh, another year. Um, and quick shout out at this point for uh, Elena Berger, which basically started um, the, the whole Wayland ecosystem in Rust. Um, so without her, all the client side stuff wouldn't exist. And she also started the server side stuff, but it was a little bit over her head to do this alone. And I was looking for a new side project at the time. <laughs> um, so I'm also uh, consider myself a Rustation, not that this will come up a whole lot in doing the talk, but. You know, I figured I'd just out myself here and there. Cool. So um, probably a lot of you have already heard about Wayland. I'm not sure how many actually have some association with it. So I figured I'd just start with why is Wayland? Why, why is this a thing? Um, but first of all, I want to wanna get a quick overview. Um, raise your hands if you're using Wayland on one of your main systems. OK. Now raise your hand, please, if you're using X or X11 on my main systems. Cool. So it's OK to, to raise your hand again. Please raise it if you don't really care or you don't know. Cool. Yeah, so that's, that's actually what we want to have, because Wayland in and of itself as a technology is just a protocol. You know, there shouldn't be a whole lot of difference in the UX. Um, but because of some limitations, some good, some bad, there are some proper strong feelings around, so and I hope I can mitigate some of these today. So if you look up on Wayland.org what the project actually says about itself, then this is the definition you're getting, right? So Wayland is a replacement for the X11 Windows system protocol and architecture with the aim to be easier to develop, extend, and maintain. Okay, so the thing is maintenance, obviously. Um, but to really understand that definition, you need to know what a Windows system protocol exactly is. Um, so um, let me give you a quick um, idea of what an application that wants to draw a window is actually doing. Um, so usually an application should have no business in knowing what, what desktops, what monitors, um, or what displays you have attached to your computer, right? Why, why should it know? It's just one of many. Um, so usually an application renders somewhere in memory on, onto a buffer and then just passes that buffer along to the system that is actually taking all of your different windows, puts them together in a coherent picture and then sends that off to your display controller. And that entity, um, whatever that may be, is what we um, call on X11 the X server and what we call on Wayland the Wayland compositor, you know, because it composites windows together. Um, so this is kind of a server-client architecture, so when I say application, I mean client. When I say client, I mean application. Um, but the talk will be mostly focused on the server side. Um, 
And it also handles input the other way around. So the only thing actually this application does at the slowest level is just multiplexing resources, right? You have the resource of the display and you want to be able to use that for multiple applications. So that get, gets multiplexed and the same goes for input. You just have one set of input devices usually um, and you want to control multiple applications for that. Yeah, and that is what historically the X server has been. There was only one X server and that was the thing that took all your buffers from all your windows, puts them together, sends them off, and then you get a desktop. Um, so obviously, looking at the definition, there must have been something wrong with X11 that we're trying to replace it. Um, so let's dive a little deeper into that. Um, the biggest problem is there's no X outside of the X server, right? So we talked about a Windows system protocol earlier. The protocol technically is X11. And the implementation, the one program actually speaking this protocol on the server side is the X server. And there's no other implementation that you would consider seriously using for the Linux desktop um, that also speaks the X11 protocol. And the biggest reason for this is that there are a lot of APIs in the X server and it's really not fun to implement that again. Um, because the X server is 30, 40 years old, um, there's for example a whole bunch of drawing APIs in there, right? Because people wanted just to draw an application, so they wanted to draw some lines, they wanted to draw some curves, um, or whatever is easy to draw, draw in UI, so all of those drawing APIs were initially in there. Um, there's also, of course, then text rendering in there, right? What, what is an application without text? And anyone who had the pleasure of working on text rendering knows how ludicrously difficult that can be. And that's definitely not something you want to implement into a compositor, yet that happened, because it made sense at the time. And there are dozens of mandatory extensions that you need to implement to be able to call yourself a valid X11 server. Um, some good, some kind of OK, but most these days relatively useless. Um, but they're mandatory, right? The protocol demands they are there, so to be a valid implementation, you kind of need to have them. Uh, in short, lots and lots of legacy technology, um, which is exactly what Wayland aims to solve. Um, so let's drive that point home a little further. I made some models. Um, so here you see what historically the Xox server looked like. You have this daemon, the Xox server in the middle. Um, the applications can speak to it. And it had a driver interface, right? Because of course you have different vendors of video devices, you have different vendors of input devices, and um, those only multiplied by time, right? So we have one of those for each. Um, giant vendor, sometimes multiple because of you know, a proprietary driver and an open source one existing. And you have another one of those for every virtualized vendor like VMware and probably some, some other weird stuff. So this list is far longer than I make it out to be. Um, and then there are input drivers because you, know, you can only abstract so much in the kernel and when synaptic touchpads on laptops kind of came around, they had their own driver. That's not really an issue these days anymore. Um, but there's lots of specialized input hardware, like for example, drawing tablets. Um, Wacom used to have their own driver um, and that kind of stuff. Um, so if you then think about, okay, we have all these protocols and the X server, so that application gets pretty huge. And we have a whole bunch of drivers and you quickly realize why the system is not scaling um, very well. Let's take, for example, NVIDIA as a hardware vendor because we like to, to boo on somebody. Um, and they have a bunch of marketing terms of stuff their GPUs can do. For example, surround view, yeah, you can link multiple displays together so they behave as one. You have SLI where you can link GPUs together. You have stereo rendering, anyone remember 3D TVs? Um, you have in laptops, of course, Optimus setups where you have an integrated and a dedicated GPU. Um, you have VR these days and the low latency capture for game streaming or recording and G-Sync variable refresh rate, right? And for every one of these marketing terms, there exists probably a diff the same technology under a different name by another vendor, right? So AMD or in, in the old days ATI probably has this implemented as well. Intel is now also entering the space. So you, if you have those separated drivers, you have a whole lot of code application, right? Everybody, everyone basically does the same thing, um, but with their own implementation, um, because that's how X11 used to work. Um, these days, the situation isn't that bad anymore, right? So we have um, in the kernel something that is called KMS now, which stands for kernel mode setting. Okay, cool, that's the mode setting component in the kernel, I guess. What does it really mean? Well, it's part of the DRM API, 
um, not DRM as in digital rights management, but as in direct rendering manager. We really suck at naming things. Um, what, what is that? Um, well, I don't really have the time to cover it, but it basically abstracts a lot of common features of graphics and um, resource constraints related to those features, right? You maybe have five outputs on your graphics card, but the graphics card can actually only drive three at once. And maybe if you use one analog output, the other analog part also doesn't work anymore, but you can use three digital ones or something like that, right? So all of these constraints and a lot of the features on the previous slides are much, much better abstracted by this API these days. So we kind of just only need one driver anymore, the mode setting driver. And the same goes for input. We have libinput these days. libinput has a bunch of code that deals with whole weird quirks of a lot of weird input devices and tries to abstract them away in a way that makes sense for developers, right? You have mouse with numerous of buttons. You have keyboards. Drawing tablets are also in there. You have touchpads. You have touch screens. So that also gets rid of a lot of drivers. We just have a libinput driver. And everybody's happy these days, right? Um, no, not really. And um, this is basically just how it started. We started at the kernel level, revising all of that stuff. We added different layers in between. For example, we have on most systems at least a system D here because nobody actually wants to run XORG as root on this system, but it needs to communicate with hardware. So that's what system D is doing there. And then we, of course, have modern desktop environments, right? Nobody is running X server on its own anymore, though it technically still works. Um, so we have a whole bunch of special clients that are taking the role of a window manager or of a, compo a compositor, and that is actually the same function that the X server is actually doing on its own, if you want to, or that a Wayland compositor is doing. It allows you to offload the compositing in a completely separate process, which can then do fancy drawing animations like rotating cubes when you switch workspaces and stuff like that. So at that point, the X server is really not doing a whole lot anymore, right? So the, the compositing is laid off, um, window management is laid off, there are a whole bunch of specialized clients. Why are all these clients communicating through this giant pile of crap that has accumulated over the years anymore, right? That doesn't make a whole lot of sense. What we, um, but also this picture is way too easy, of course. Um, there used to be, so if you want to do hardware acceleration, there used to be a library called libglx, which is heavily tied to x11. So um, you get like this weird interconnected dependencies where um, if you have an application that uses libglx, there needs to be an X server to talk to the GPU to do rendering stuff, even if you wanted to do off-screen rendering, right? Even if something was never displayed in a window somewhere on a screen, you needed to have an XORG running, which whose primary purpose it was initially to multiplex screens. So what, what kind of sense does that make? Um, there are other libraries in the mix these days. So libgbm handles memory allocations for buffers that you want to actually send to your display controller. Um, so that is used by the mode setting driver. And libegl starts to replace libglx because it can actually run on different um, backends. So you can have an x11 backend if you want to draw on a window on an x. So you can have a Wayland backend, but you can also have a headless backend and a whole bunch of others. And that is a much better separation because usually GPU and display controller, at least in the modern um, world, are on the same physical device. You have a graphics card which can do rendering and which can drive displays, but they don't have to be. Like on most embedded devices, on ARM devices these days, on phones, those are separated, separate entities um, that might even not share the same driver because why would they? One thing is just concerned with taking a buffer, putting that somewhere on a screen, and the other is concerned with doing rendering really fast. Um, they actually don't have any, any correlation. So XOR kind of creeps into all of these libraries and drivers, and we, we want to get rid of it. And the desktop environment is a whole bunch of different stuff. Like You also have applications, like maybe a settings application that belongs technically to your desktop environment. And, and it's really not that nice to maintain, which is hopefully now a little clearer. So what we want to have instead is something like this, where we have a Wayland compositor which does a whole bunch of this, this stuff, right? So it is the shell, um, usually, that is implemented inside the Wayland compositor, though it could be externally. Um, we have uh, 
and we, we unite some of these parts into that single process, which is then the only process actually talking to libgbm to drive the display controller, which might also call into libegl to do fancy rendering, you know, rotating cubes and that stuff on its own. Um, but it doesn't have to because we have now a much clearer line of separation of concerns, right? The applications might want to use the GPU, the compositor might want to use the GPU, but the two don't really need to know about what the other is doing. They're just passing buffers around a protocol, right? Easy. Um, so, and what's important to get here is that a Wayland compositor is just one implementation of the same protocol. So GNOME has their own Wayland compositor. KDE has their own Wayland compositor. There are smaller ones like Sway, um, or the ones built on Smithy or whatever, and they um, all implement the same protocol, but they are not the same thing. And with Wayland, it is much easier to reinvent the wheel, so to speak, and to do your own thing um, if you're not, not happy with the stuff that is already out there. Um, and it's also because we have now a clear separation not bound to any particular backend or driver or hardware. Um, this is just how most of, most of them look if you're looking at the Linux desktop. But really, every application speaking the Wayland protocol doesn't really know what the compositor will then do with its buffers. It doesn't have to run on lib input on KMS on Linux. There are Wayland compositors for other operating systems that work just fine with, with a Wayland application. And of course, things are not that easy. We kind of get XOR creeping in again because of backwards compatibility. You know, you want to run your old apps, a lot of games maybe that will never get ported to Wayland or Java applications, which should still have a long road to add for native Wayland support and all of this good stuff. So you kind of have another XOR running as a separate process speaking the Wayland protocol to the compositor and then just being an X server to apps. And that is also not a re-implementation. That is just a different front end for the X server itself. So all the legacy code is still in there, although not used in this specific use case. So listening to this talk so far, you might get the idea that Wayland is all about technology, but that's also actually not the case. Um, we now have the chance to do some things right because we are starting from scratch again, right? And one of these things is what I like to call use case over a mechanism or policy. What do I mean by that? Um, let's take a look at an example. This is a rather old but still very relevant specification, the ICCCM. And we just take a look at one specific part of it, 4.1.7, that regards itself with input focus, right? How difficult could that be? One application has the focus and that's where your keyboard presses go, right? That, what, what could go wrong? And immediately it starts to list a number of modes of input focus that an application can have. And the first one is kind of similar to understand it's no input. The client never expects keyboard input. And then it lists a bunch of examples that nobody actually uses these days anymore. But, you know, input on, output only client, okay, I, I kind of get that, I guess. Right, so we have a client that doesn't want input, sure. And the next one is passive input. It never really explains why it's passive, but, but okay. And that also starts kind of sanely. The client expects keyboard input, but never explicitly says, sets the focus. And an example would be a simple client with no subwindows. Okay, so this client can take input, but it will never grab input itself. Okay, good, easy enough, I guess. Then comes locally active input, and that explanation is much longer than what is written here. And that is basically, it's, that is basically the client expects to get keyboard input at some point and then might shuffle this, the input around its own windows. Why would the client do that? I don't know. It seems unexpected to me that suddenly a different window is focused than I clicked on. But that's, that's a mode, right? That's something Xorg does. And then there's globally active input and that, that thing is huge and pain, pain to, to look at and to understand. And the important thing for, for the point I'm trying to drive home is this is all a mechanism, right? Xorg just tells you how input is managed, uh, how input focus is managed. It doesn't, it does never really say to you why you should do a certain thing. It sometimes lists an example of what a client might do, so it wants this kind of input, but never actually is explained why you would need or want to use that, and also maybe when you don't want to use certain things. Um, let's take a look at the Wayland Core Protocol instead and what it says about this. 
There's the keyboard.enter event. Okay, easy enough. The description starts with enter event. Okay, cool. And it just says notification that the seed's keyboard focus is on a certain surface. And that's all that the core protocol does. You get a notification that your surface is now keyboard focused. That's it. Um, and then it goes on with what the compositor might do next, you know, tell you which modifiers on your keyboard are pressed, shift key and whatnot, um, to um, follow the spec of the protocol. And if you start to think about that, totally makes sense, but you might easily run into use cases that are actually not covered by this very simple mechanism. A big one um, for a lot of people in the beginning, at least running Wayland, is um, how do you implement a global shortcut? You know, maybe you want to hold down a key um, or press a key to quickly mute yourself in Discord or whatever, no matter if the application is actually in focus or not. There needs to be a way to kind of steal those input events, right? No, says Wayland. That is an explicitly defined use case, keyboard shortcuts. There needs to be a separate protocol um, which tries to secure that and make sense of that. Um, that is not something every application should do, so the core protocol doesn't concern itself with this use case. And um, there's a bunch of other of these shortcomings that have usually been problems by, uh, in this um, migration from X11 to Wayland, right? So you as, an, as a client, as an application, don't know about any other windows. Again, why would you? But maybe there are cases where that makes sense. Maybe you are a taskbar and you want to render uh, a field for every active window or a doc application or what, whatever, I don't know. Um, you cannot position your windows arbitrarily. Also, kind of sounds confusing and not very consistent, like I don't want my windows to move themselves around. But then the argument that is always brought up for this is, well, I want my application to remember where the windows were laid out the last time it was open. But if you start to think harder about this use case, that also quickly falls apart. Because what if the user has a different output connected now? Does, does the user really want the window to be on the same place? What is if the scaling has changed, if, if it's maybe another machine, but you copied your user profile over, and um, all of that stuff is something the application cannot really anticipate, but your compositor might have um, the necessary information, um, or there might be some settings for the desktop environment. You also cannot steal focus. Again, that's the example we had before. You cannot arbitrarily intercept or listen to any inputs. You cannot copy screen contents of any other window screen. That is actually how screen sharing used to work. Um, and that is still possible in X11. Like every window can just look at the contents of any other window and that is obviously not a security problem at all. Um, but there's a solution to each of these things and the problem is just that in the beginning where Wayland was kind of new, all of these things were not specified yet. So obviously a Wayland desktop environment couldn't do these in a standardized way. Um, these days a window of one application might make itself known to another application or you can ask the compositor to save and restore state for you. And you don't even have to specify what state, you just say, well, if I'm restarted again, I want this kind of feel familiar to the user, do whatever you can. And then the compositor maybe has implemented restoring the window at the same position, maybe it hasn't. Um, you can request to be activated, you know? I want focus what the environment will actually do with that information or maybe just ignore it is up to the environment. Again, you want a consistent behavior usually. Um, you can request global shortcuts. That was only recently merged, so not a whole lot of apps do that already. And then you also can start, uh, can, you can ask for a screencast. So maybe you are a browser, the user clicks on a square, share screen button, and then the, the browser will just say, hey, the user wants to share, start a screencast. It will not show you the list of windows to capture. It will not show you the list of screens. That is then all done by the compositor and all the application gets back is a video stream, which might contain anything, but does the browser really need to know? No, not really. Um, and that is kind of the, the idea of a lot of these protocols and why this might feel cumbersome to you, um, but it is there for a purpose and usually um, there just needs to be someone who to bring up a specific use case on the Wayland Protocols repo, for example, and the issue tracker, and then it will get decided how to best serve that, that use case while not breaking security completely, like we just did with X11. So I just mentioned the Wayland Core Protocol, but of course there are lots and lots of protocols, all optional. 
a completely different approach to X11 where almost everything was mandatory. Um, and that is just a third of a very nice website called Wayland.app, um, where you can browse most of these protocols and take a look at them. Um, and um, I'm just going to quickly go over the kind of two most important ones for Linux desktop um, and skip over the rest because we don't really have the time for that. So the most important one is, of course, the core protocol um, that defines a few objects, um, mainly the display, which is a singleton, which always exists. And then you can ask the display to give you a registry. And from the registry, you can list every single protocol the compositor supports. And then you can decide, well, which, uh, which ones do I actually want to use as an application. Um, then there's the compositor, global, kind of bad name actually, but it, it gives you surfaces, stuff that can be displayed on the screen, kind of makes sense. And to actually get something to be displayed on a surface, you attach a buffer to it. And the core protocol defines one way, there are others, to get such a buffer. And that is the SHM or shared memory module, where you can request a buffer to be shown in a shared region, uh, to be re represented by a shared region of memory, um, where you can just put your pixels. There's also the data device, which concerns itself with you know, exchanging data between different windows, so mainly clipboard, but also drag and drop stuff. Um, there's the output, which actually shouldn't exist, which just gives you some information about the connected displays. Um, and it's not really used anymore these days. And then there's the seed, which is just that, a seed in front of a computer with a set of input devices, mostly pointer, keyboard, and touch. There are a few others, but they are less important to understand the, the general idea. And then there are shell protocols, and the only one that's stable there and used in the Linux desktop space is the XDG shell protocol, um, which then wraps the surface that we talked about before into an XDG surface and then defines two variants of that, the top level, which is your usual application window, and a pop-up, which is you know a quick pop-up like a drop-down menu or something in your application, and then also some objects to tell the compositor how the pop-up should be positioned relatively to the top level. And that's basically it. With these two protocols, you, uh, if you implement them in your Wayland compositor, you get GTK apps, Qt apps, everything running. Every, everything works off these two protocols. Um, but there are, of course, a bunch of others, um, which we'll talk about in a minute. Let's, let's first dive a little deeper into how I would do that. So let's say you have the compositor global, and you ask it, well, I want to have a surface. The Wayland protocol gives you a surface. And then you ask the XDG shell global, the VM base. I want to actually have an XDG surface because I want to later do that with the top level stuff that you give me. And I want that XDG surface to be represented by this VL surface. And um, then uh, you can ask the XDG surface, which is a little annoying, you know, to get give you a top level. But at this point, you have three objects which all refer to the same thing. Um, which extend upon each other. You have the top level, you have the underlying XCG surface, and the VL surface. And then you can commit all of that state, so the compositor knows, okay, um, I want to actually display the surface. Which the compositor will then answer you with a configure request, so it will tell you, uh, well, your window is 100 pixels by 100 pixels, and also is currently activated because you're the only window you get focus. Maybe, maybe that's the reason. Um, and then, actually, you can um, uh, attach a buffer to your surface um, and also tell the compositor, yes, uh, this is the configure request that I just answered, um, and send that off. And all of that is completely asynchronously. So if I get another configure request while all of this is happening, then compositor still knows in what state I am because with the ACK uh, call, I tell it which, is, which of the different configure requests I am answering right now. And that is also playing, again, in user experience and use cases and stuff like that, because um, that protocol allows uh, the compositor to always know in which state the application is, you know, no weird race conditions with resizing through multiple processes, the app to the X server to the window manager and back and forth and locking the connection off, that weird stuff. Um, the second this buffer is attached um, with the right size, the Wayland compositor can display it, and that plays into the idea that every frame should be perfect under Wayland. Um, 
There are a bunch of other protocols that I just quickly glance over. We saw the big list. For example, there's the presentation time where you can ask um, as, as a client, the composer to tell you when your frame was displayed. So maybe you're a video player and that is kind of important to sync up the video with your audio stream that you're playing. Uh, maybe there's the view proto protocol available, which allows you to attach buffers that have not the right size to a surface and then let the compositor scale or crop those um, buffers for you. Um, there's the decoration protocol, famously not implemented by GNOME, um, which allows the compositor to tell the client if it would like the client to decorate itself or not. And then the client can tell the compositor what it is actually doing. Um, there's the tablet protocol for you know drawing tablets because those were kind of not specified in the core protocol. Um, there's the relative pointer protocol, which might be used by games to get relative input events so that when you're hitting the screen, um, the edge of your screen with your mice, um, your uh, first person shooter will not, will not just stop moving, but you can freely rotate 360 degrees. Um, or the text input protocol, which is used for accessibility stuff like on-screen keyboards and such. Um, there's a recently merged fractional scaling protocol, which should hopefully improve uh, blurry text um, on, on high, DPI, high DPI screens. There's the content type protocol, which is a very, very nice example for a use case again. So with that, you can say as a client, well, the contents that I'm showing are of the type game or video or text or whatever, and then the compositor can decide to do something with that information. Maybe it wants to try to lower the latency of the rendering pipeline if a game is displayed. Maybe not. You as a client shouldn't care. You don't have any control about this, but you can try to give as much compositor uh, information to the compositor to um, let that make an informed decision for you. And um, that is that is the thing, right? So there's a bunch of optional protocols. A lot of them, even if they are unstable or currently in staging or whatnot, are still implemented by compositors. You also find that information, like which desktop environment actually supports this protocol on uh, Wayland.app. And then you can um, go ham and either just take the fewest of those protocols or all of them or whatever the compositor gives you, which sounds really annoying. So let's quickly jump into the perspective of an application developer and usually don't have to handle any of this, right? So usually the toolkit does this for you. I said previously GTK and Qt only need two protocols, but they will use a bunch more of these if they are available and if not just fall back gracefully as good as they can. Um, but that kind of leaves the question, how do I do stuff that involves the compositor and that is not really covered by these protocols. Like, how do I intercept input if I need to do that, if I want to do global shortcuts? How do I do screen sharing or maybe remote desktop stuff, you know, where I need to inject input events? Um, or how do I write certain clients? Like on X11, I could just write a taskbar or a lock screen or, or clipboard managers, right? Those are a thing. Um, how do I I'll do all of this stuff on Wayland? And theoretically, there are protocols for this under certain namespaces, which is why um, you see a lot of VLR for real roots, for example, popping up there. we we'll talk about that later. Um, and then there's another different set of protocols that kind of do the same thing, for example, by the KDE guys. Oh, that sounds similar, but GTK shell actually does nothing that layer shell or that plasma shell does. And that's really bad as a client, right? Um, so, and also, if the toolkit is handling all of that, do, need, do the toolkits need to implement every single protocol? Do I need to ask my toolkit for writing a launcher? That also seems kind of weird. Um, no, you would actually not use any of these protocols. Um, you as an application would instead use the XGG portal at, or desktop portal um, API, which is a DBus API. So now you might ask yourself, okay, why do I need to involve another technology with this? What, what is the problem with Wayland? Why can't we standardize a protocol and just use a Wayland protocol for that, right? And the thing with Wayland is, it might surprise you, but it's not X11. Um, and the problem with that is, you know, if you're, for example, a browser vendor and you want to implement screen sharing, you don't want to implement that for X11 and for Wayland. It's already bad enough that you need to do this for every single operating system. Maybe you don't want to implement multiple ways, ways to do the same thing in the same operating system, right? At some point, it gets silly. And also, the Wayland protocol is sadly not the easiest to proxy and to secure in some kind of way. Um, so Dbus steps in here because it has no connection to any of these things. It works on Wayland or X11 or nothing. It doesn't care. 
Um, and it's already can be proxied and authenticated as we, for example, see with Flatpak, which does some sandboxing and um, filters, debus calls and stuff like that. So we can get proper permission dialogues um, if you care about that sort of thing. And um, which leaves the question, why are these Wayland protocols there? Well, they're mostly either for privileged clients that are run directly by the shell. Um, so they are for internal use, not really a public API. Um, or they just existed before the desktop portal were a thing, was a thing. Or um, they are maybe the channel back from the, pro from the portal process back to the compositor. But then again, that's an implementation detail. That's nothing you sh need to concern yourself with. And really for a bunch of these things that we previously talked about, there is already a portal these days. Again, Global Shortcode was only merged recently, but it's there now and hopefully apps will quickly make use of it. So if you have a favorite application that still doesn't do screen sharing on, uh, Lin on, on Wayland, looking at your Discord, and then you just need to uh, ask the developers to please implement this protocol and then it will work everywhere. That's the idea. It might even work on something in the future that is uh, replacing Wayland because, again, it's a it's, uh, it's completely separate layer and what it does in the background is not really the business of the application. Um, which also um, means there's a portal implementation for every major um, desktop environment. Everybody does their own portal like they do their own compositor. So a quick, quick look at how will the Prelin protocol look. It of, is, of course, developing rapidly. There are a bunch of proposals for different protocols. Um, I am involved in some of them. Um, and uh, I just want to highlight one, because we don't have a whole lot of time, which is the color management protocol, um, which will finally allow us to have HDR content on Wayland. And that thing uh, exists for two years now, the proposal. Um, there's a completely separate repository that is just, just collecting information about color management and HDR to finally get this thing right because it's very complex. Um, there's a whole um, pull request for Western, um, which is um, uh, uh, an important compositor, I'll talk about it in a minute, which has already 20 checklist items completed out of 57. So it will take some more time. Um, but we are close to having at least some uh, functionality of that protocol, hopefully pretty soon. Um, that's awesome work done uh, mostly by Collabora, I think, these days, but a whole bunch of people are involved in this protocol. Um, so to wrap this up, let me quickly give you an idea of the ecosystem. So as I said just now, there's Western, which is a reference compositor by the Wayland project, which was serving as an example on how you could build a Wayland compositor in the beginning, so that this could be then ex uh, adopted by other um, desktop environments. For example, of course, GNOME, they have their compositor Matter, uh, or KDE, which has their compositor KWIN. And um, then recently, we have seen a bunch of smaller libraries that people can use to write their own compositors, and um, the most famous one being VL Roots, um, which was started um, as a base for Sway. Sway actually existed before that. Um, um, to port the famous i3 window manager over into something that is usable on Wayland and behaves kind of same. Um, and there are thousands. This whole uh, slide used to be covered with compositors uh, based on the VL Roots library. Um, I just name a few. Cage, for example, is a really good kiosk compositor. So if you want to run Wayland in some embedded space, maybe. There's Gamescope, which is developed by Valve these days um, to do um, interesting stuff, um, mainly sh short uh, paths for getting X11 games actually quickly through the display pipeline onto the screen. Um, and there's also, um, as I said, a bunch more. And another library called Smithy, which is what I'm developing, same thing, but in Rust kind of, not just re-implemented, but we're kind of doing our own thing to explore a more and less C-like API. And that has mostly the Cosmic Comp Compositor, so the thing for Cosmic DE implemented on top. Um, but also a bunch of others, um, mostly still work in progress. So um, as a call for action, if you want to write your own Gwellian Compositor, it's actually much easier than it sounds because you just need these two protocols and you don't need to concern yourself with all the legacy X11 has uh, built up. Let me give you a quick showcase of a bunch of cool projects using Wayland Compositors. Um, first off, you can actually make money with this, like not 
not by doing my job, because these kind of jobs are kind of rare, but for example, Automotive Great Linux, which is by, used by a whole lot of vendors, uses Wayland as a protocol and a different shell, the, uh, I don't get the name out of, out of memory now, um, for, for displaying all these applications. Um, probably, we don't know because they are not using Automotive Great Linux. Tesla is also doing Wayland stuff um, because it's far easier to implement and then just runs X Wayland on top of that to get Steam running because that's the thing you can do now in your car. Cool. Um, what, who's definitely using Wayland, which you know about is Chrome OS with their recent Steam beta, but they have done so previously to get Android apps on Chrome OS and um, they just implemented a Wayland backend in um, Android because it's, yeah, okay, we, we get a buffer and we kind of shove that into the different system and then that also works. Um, of course, SteamOS does. We just uh, just talked briefly about Gamescope. Um, um, and there's also other companies doing weird stuff like running Linux applications on Windows through VSL, which is really cool technology. Um, if you want to know more about how this Chimera works, um, I highly recommend um, their latest update talk on, on the technology from uh, this year's Ubuntu Summit. Um, super interesting uh, from a technology standpoint. Kind of weird if, if you think about what parts of the developer experience Microsoft tries to combine and own here, but you know, um, let's not get into that. Um, there's something completely different, K1 FT, which is a re-implementation of K1 on top of VL Roots in order to try and shave down the uh, code size of K1. So people are not doing their own thing for the sake of it. People are actually trying to um, combine stuff into libraries um, which can be commonly used. There's no proposal yet uh, for this to actually replace K1, but you can just install it if you're a KDE user and it should work basically all the same. Just use a different library in the background. Um, there's Stardust, which is a VR compositor. Again, kind of a thing because, you know, the application does not assume any backend. It doesn't assume 2D rendering necessarily. Um, Stardust is implemented on top of Smithy. Um, there's WayDroid, um, which does what we talked about with Chrome OS, just an open source. So you can get your Android reps running on, on uh, your Wayland desktop, because why not? Um, I'm not shilling about my own compositor, um, but I'm shilling about a different component built from a colleague of mine, which is the Cosmic Panel, um, which is our panel and also a doc application powered by the same technology. And that is just a Wayland compositor. Every single icon in there is an XTG shell app. Um, and then the compositor just places them nicely next to each other, translates the input coordinates and um, sends the buffers back to, to the host compositor and then spawns pop-ups of these applications as native pop-ups for the panel. So it's really extensible. You can just load Doom into there or I don't know, whatever you want. Um, there's also some interesting stuff on CI pipelines. For example, VLCS is a library which you can use to test your compositor, that it implements uh, all the protocol functions in spec and then run headlessly against and it tells you if kind of the functions are doing the expected thing or not. Um, super cool project from the Mir guys. You know, Mir is kind of still around from Canonical. Um, there's WayPipe, because Wayland in itself itself is not network transparent. Um, WayPipe just fakes a, fakes, is a Wayland compositor on one side, and then compresses all of those images together, sends them over a network to a client running on the other side, which then talks to the compositor there. Um, it also does stuff transparently, like GPU contents and code stem, and sends them over as an H.264 stream, and it's actually really low latency. Super cool technology. Um, there's Greenfield, which is a HTML5 compositor, because why not? And, and that actually works kind of the same way as WayPipe. It's just H.264 streams over WebSocket and then rendered in a browser. Um, but, you know, also and kind of cool and interesting. There's this little um, weekend project of mine, which is running uh, a Wayland compositor as a GStreamer plugin. Why would you do such a thing? Well, um, because I want to build my own GeForce Now cloud at home and um, there are people who have implemented the game stream protocol on top of GStreamer, so I now can pipe um, apps um, through through that and onto um, different devices in my household. And none of those apps know that they are running completely headlessly in this kind of weird environment. So next, maybe, could be your project here. Um, I certainly hope this inspired you. As I said, that was a weekend project. It's really just a thousand lines. Um, and I think half of that is probably GStreamer overhead. And 
Um, if you're still asking yourself, well, where do I start? Look no further than Real Roots, which is a very, very nice library, mature and well-tested, um, run for a long time. Has no real proprietary driver support, though it kind of works on the NVIDIA driver. Um, but it has a very, very large community and a whole lot of clients which can already handle a bunch of stuff for you if you um, just use this library. Um, but it's written in C. You know, Some might find this appealing, others might not. Um, and there was an example compositor, which you can just copy and get going, and that is just 700 lines, like easily something you can understand in an afternoon. Um, of course, there's also Smithy, um, catching up more and more every day, but still not, not feature parity. Um, though very friendly, though very small community, um, we make an attempt at supporting every driver because I have to for my job. And um, it's written in Rust, you know? We, we just saw yesterday why you shouldn't maybe write C anymore um, if you want to try, give that a go. We also have a very small example compositor that's slightly larger, but shouldn't hopefully not really matter. So, um, thank you for listening. I hope um, this was interesting to some of you. And um, if you want to find me, I'm usually in Assembly 2. Tell me about your crazy project ideas or whatnot. Um, feel free to chat with me um, about anything Wayland related. Um, yeah, thanks so, so much. <laughs>
a logic delegated to the client. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you handle things like different subpixel color arrangements while dragging your window between uh, your projector and your internal screen or something like that? Um, the subpixel arrangement is actually communicated via the VL output protocol, and you know as a window on which outputs you are shown, just not the position there. So you can submit buffers for different subpixel arrangements for text rendering. Um, your toolkit just needs to do that. Or if you implement your own toolkit, um, things have gotten a lot more difficult in the last couple of years um, to do all of these stuff and accessibility and whatnot. But really, uh, building a good user experience is, was always difficult. So I would strongly recommend to just use uh, Q, um, GTK or Qt. Uh, you said that uh, GNOME doesn't support the XDK uh, declaration protocol. I'm not sure, but I thought that was addressed using, if, if the application supports it, using the libdcore library by the GNOME developers. Uh, libdcore just does client-side declaration for you. So if you are a client and you don't want to deal with decorations, but you want to have nice decorations, you lose libdcore. Unfortunately, libdcore doesn't really have, I think it's still an open pull request, a GTK backend to draw the title bar with GTK, so it would fit into the GNOME theme. And um, even if it does at some point, that is kind of a hack, and the GNOME developers even acknowledge it themselves, because you can't really do uh, render GTK stuff off screen and then copy the title bar in there. Um, so. There is no really a good solution on this desktop environment. Um, but that's also, I think actually this is a good thing, also that you don't have to um, support every single protocol, because previously you had to fight the X protocol, right? So for example, every client could override the color profile of your monitor. And then demons like color D from GNOME would just reset that to the color profile that was um, previously configured by the user. Um, which is, of course, not a really nice solution. As GNOME, you would, when you have Color D running, you would just like to prohibit clients from changing that. Um, and all other use cases weren't supported in the first place. Um, so with Wayland, you can actually express that, that you just don't support certain functionality. And GNOME chooses to do so, and it's a pain in the butt for a whole lot of people, but you, I don't know, you have the choice. Either use it or don't use it. It's no weird, well, I can do these kind of hacks anymore. Um, it's a plain and clear cut, and I think that's actually a win. Cool. Thank you so much. Um, as always, the hallway track um, using conferences is usually the most interesting. So um, if you want to know anything more about all of this stuff, I could have easily talked three hours about this. You know, um, Feel free to chat with me about it. I'm also here the next couple of days. Again, thank you so much for listening. Also, thanks to Janice for uh, dragging me uh, to do this on the last day of the call for participation. Um, it was a nice experience. Thank you so much. <laughs>